All right, so we're going to treat this space as it's going to be kind of like a sequel to the last one. And we're going to concatenate some of these ideas that I was discussing. The first topic of discussion that I want to breach is this idea that surrealism, surrealism is a way more powerful ideology than realism. And surrealism, if it ever goes toe to toe, and ever has a showdown with realism, surrealism wins, especially if there's a good artist behind the movement, okay? We talked about how facts are fungible, right? People don't understand facts have a mushy quality to them, okay? Facts are always rotating. The truth changes quite frequently. And I talked about how men like to tantalize themselves by claiming that the search for truth is a masculine endeavor. And I argued the opposite and I said, no, no, no. The masculine creates reality and creates truth. The tastemakers, the kingmakers. Let me tell you something. Someone creates a fucking digital two-bit picture of a fucking triceratops wearing a red cardigan and puts that on open sea and sells that fucking image for two million dollars who just created reality and who created truth out of thin air right it's how markets work it's how mark markets function it's it, facts are always in flux and the people who are front-running reality the creators of this are the ones who win every fucking day of the week. Now, I'm going to give you very practical examples of what creating truth looks like and what architecting reality looks like. All right? Because in my view, from where I'm standing, the most Nietzschean living figure today, to date, that I'm aware of, somebody who essentially came out of the primordial ooze and catapulted to the top is Andrew Tate. And I don't think people truly understand, look, this is no man's land. I, I think there's very few people out there who actually perceive the brilliance of that meteoric rise. And it's not what you think. There's, I, I have been able to pinpoint one quality, one attribute, that gave Andrew Tate an open lane to the top. And when I tell you open lane, what I'm really saying is no man's land. Like motherfuckers were taking traffic cones out of the way and saying, here you go, buddy. Open highway. Open march. No competition. And he carved out that open lane, and I'm going to tell you why. All right? Let's go back into some historicity. Let's fucking dissect a couple things, okay? The style, and I've, I've mentioned this before, but we're going to go a little bit deeper. The style of marketing that you see spurn out of the WWE, the World Wrestling Federation, okay? Those characters, the kind of psychopomp, the arrogance, Shawn Michaels, getting a fucking microphone telling you he's the sexiest man alive, right? Over and over again. Even his music, his entrance music, when he would come out, I'm a sexy boy. This motherfucker would pick up a microphone and just tell you over and over and over again how wonderful, how delightful, how perfect, what a fucking specimen he is. And that created a gravitational beam, much like Andrew Tate. Do you guys understand this? Let's, let's flesh this out. Let's get down to the fucking heart of the matter. I, there was a tweet that I said two years ago, and it was controversial. But I said, as a man, the sweet spot for looks is you really actually want to be a physical five or six in looks. Average looking man, average build as a man gives you a, a hundred times more upside than any other motherfucker. And I'm going to tell you why. Andrew Tate is objectively not a classically handsome guy at all. 
at all, not by any stretch of the imagination. Now, let me tell you something, and this went over everybody's head. This man would flip open a camera and tell you over and over and over again repeatedly that he is the sexiest man alive, he's the sexiest fucking man in the world, and nobody batted a fucking eyelash. It wasn't even cringy. It wasn't even cringy because that kind of arrogance and machismo works very well when you're not the thing you claim you are. This is very important. If you are a classically handsome, good-looking dude, there is 0% chance you can pull that off. There is no way you can step in front of a fucking camera. Brad Pitt, picture Brad Pitt going up on fucking stage and telling you how fucking sexy and attractive he is. It would be the cringiest fucking thing you've ever seen in your entire fucking life. People would recoil because you can never name what you are. You can only name what you're not and then people will believe it. That's one of the most strange paradox of life. If you are genuinely a terrifically funny individual, don't you dare tell anybody that you recognize that's true. If you're a good looking motherfucker, don't you dare let anybody fucking know that you are aware of that quality. Because as soon as you showcase awareness of the things that are working for you, it gets beyond fucking cringe. Beyond. And this is why these less aesthetically attractive men have territory in the confidence game. Because you have way more leeway, you have a much longer leash to brandish pomposity. You can be absurdist. You can be totally fucking surreal. And people are going to be like, who the fuck is this guy? It creates a gravitational pull. You say these things enough times, you know what I'm saying? An, an ugly motherfucker can actually get on camera and tell you he's the sexiest man alive. That phenomenon is, is rarely going to get challenged because it's so absurd. It does something to the fucking human mind. It melts something away where you just kind of, you know it's not true on the surface, but it drills in a deeper fucking department. It just does. It has that fucking unique quality. And so the good looking motherfuckers, the reason why I've always said being good looking as a guy, too good looking, I want to say, is a curse, is because you arrogance hurts you bad when you're when you're a good looking dude. It hurts you. You gotta you gotta actually learn how to tone it down. Juxtaposition, as I always say. If you're good looking, you got to do the opposite. Now, what really works for good looking motherfuckers is to be the fucking bad boy, be the tough guy. You know what I'm saying? Pretty boy exterior, but internally a fucking monster, internally a fucking beast. You know what I'm saying? I mean, look, there's no coincidence that the reason why Brad Pitt was heralded for his role in Fight Club is because he was a good looking bad boy. So again, Flirting with the fucking juxtaposition. You don't expect a good looking motherfucker to be walking in the pit, trading punches, putting that fucking pretty face at risk. That's very unusual because most pretty boys are afraid to fucking get their hands dirty. So you see how life works? You go the opposite fucking direction of what you were blessed with. Now, let's talk about something. The most powerful fucking quality, hands down, the most magical, majestic, powerful quality. There is nothing even close to this. And it goes back to my first point about creating reality is learning how to brainwash yourself. Learning how to brainwash the fuck out of yourself. Andrew Tate got up there and told you he's the most successful, badass, handsome, sexy, attractive motherfucker in the world. And he did it hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times on camera. Now, for you fucking math wizards, imagine how many times, how many iterations he had to hammer that in his own fucking head to, to fucking dig those grooves and dig those trenches in the brain to where the brain actually starts to apprehend that this is now the fucking truth. Brainwashing yourself. There is zero downside to brainwashing yourself. But here's the deal. It only works effectively when it's in conjunction with a ton of action behind it.
that's the, that's the fucking magic right there. It's, and, and I kid you not, I don't think the average person can really even comprehend the level of brainwashing that you actually do have to inflict on yourself to be successful. You, 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 it's a 24 hour job. And I'm telling you the minute you take a break or a breather and you stop bombarding yourself with these thoughts, you literally backslide and lose all the progress that you made. And you can, you could do that in a day. You could unweave, you could unweave years of brainwashing just by taking your eye off the ball and letting yourself relax for a day and lose all that fucking progress. That's why success is so tough, by the way, because here's what happens. This mechanism is, is, is very powerful. Here's, here's, here's what happens. You brainwash yourself so much that once you actually make it come true and once the material comes your way and once you've actually materially realized the bullshit that you're feeding yourself every day, you no longer need to rely on the brainwashing because the material now carries you. This explains why early creators are at their very best when they don't have anything because they have to stir up their own winds. You see, they have to stir up their own winds when there's no weather, when there's no chaos, they have to blow on things. They have to constantly stir up wind. They have to whip up weather out of nothing to continually find a way to drift and coast on their own fumes. It's a process of constantly fucking huffing your own fucking fumes that you're creating when you don't have the material to back it up. And this explains why when these creators get as big as they do, their content becomes atrocious. It becomes insufferable. It becomes almost unbearable to consume. You're like, what happened to that funny, humorous, fucking robust motherfucker I was listening to two years ago? Now he's boring. Well, yeah, because he doesn't have to brainwash himself anymore. So the performance is going to drastically suffer. This is true for artists. It's true for anybody who's just starting out. You create this character. You brainwash the fuck out of yourself that you're going to be the best. You're going to be the most successful motherfucker on earth. Boom. You get your smash hit. Now everything tanks because you just mentally don't have the necessity of beefing yourself up and puffing yourself up like you once did. And this is, this is how the world functions. This is how the male mind functions. The ones who can use their mind as a battering ram to effectively block out anything but the idea that you are the greatest in the fucking world. You are royally anointed. You are royally anointed. You are hand selected. God has a fucking photo of you on his dresser. Before God sleeps at night, he fucking pulls out a fucking locket and fucking looks fondly upon a photo of you. Until you start to fucking believe that shit in your own mind, reality will not be in congruence with that. And I'm, I'm here to tell you that this is an inescapable thing, especially if you started as a nobody and you're invisible. You're just going to have to brainwash the fuck out of yourself. And I am telling you, it is the most difficult work you can do because you're just running a jackhammer 24 fucking seven, drilling it down into the core until your brain literally has no other choice but to believe it. You have to overdose on these thoughts. You have to overdose. It should like the, you don't understand. These motherfuckers are telling themselves they're, they're hyping themselves up so hard on a daily basis. It actually makes them sick to their fucking stomach. It almost becomes like a poison because it's, it's, it takes that much force and it takes that much frequency to back it up and actually build those grooves. And then you know what you, you're doing? I just told you, you are creating a gravitational pull where people have no choice but to get sucked in like a fucking tractor beam. You are a black hole sucking in matter from every which way. And look, because this is such a flamboyant way of doing it, you're going to suck in a lot of junk into the back hole, into the black hole, right? 
a lot of debris, a lot of detritus, a lot of junk is going to get sucked into that fucking gravitational pull. And then you as the artist have to rearrange that junk and turn it into an empire. This is why I've always told you, I do not trust a motherfucker who is terrified of negative energy. And who wants to create a fucking protective bubble like a woman and say, no, 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 I don't, I, I can't be around negativity. No, 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 no. As a man, as a man, when your tractor beam is fucking pulling things in, you're going to have to deal with the good, bad, and the ugly. You got to suck it all in. And then you got to transmute that and turn that into a fucking monument. Do you understand? You're going to attract a lot of junk. You're going to attract bad people, good people, everything in between. You're going to attract the entire fucking spectrum. And you're a junk builder. That's what you are. Tate did it. It's fucking alchemy. Suck in a bunch of junk, attention from all directions, some of it negative, some of it positive. Boom. Strap it all together. Stitch it together. Erect it. Turn it into a fucking empire. Put a bow tie on it. Present it. It's a wrap, fellas. Game over. That's how you fucking win. And now a guy like Tate, the reason why you don't see that phosphorescent sort of machismo the reason you see it's it's kind of dialed down a bit is because he actually fucking walked his way into the truth so he's got the material backing now he doesn't really it's it, i told you necessity is the mother of all invention prior to that level of success he had to do this but now that he's got all the material to, to fall back on it's just not a need anymore he doesn't have to be that character you know what I'm saying? It's like you're kind of going to fall. You're going to come back to earth a little bit and, and go back to homeostasis. Now, I will say this, and this is the most impressive figure. I, look, there's an impressive figure that's living on planet Earth right now. I don't think this guy gets enough credit, but I, I, I don't see a human being who's currently living that's more powerful than Vladimir Putin. Arguably, fuck arguably, he is. Putin is 100% the richest man walking the face of this planet. There's, there's just, there's zero question. You want to talk about unlimited financing, unlimited power? That motherfucker could buy three Learjets every day, every day until the day he dies, every day. And he's, and he's, it's never going to decline. He ain't going to get rejected. That motherfucker, I'm not joking you, has unlimited financing. He has a level of power that is so unnatural and so hard to wrap your mind around that it'll almost blow a fuse trying to fucking comprehend how powerful that guy truly is. On every level. On every level. And I've said this before, and this is what's interesting about Putin to me. Look, if there was a way right now, and most of you would take this Faustian bargain, if I could give you, if I could tell you tomorrow morning you wake up, you will have access to any woman on earth that you, that you damn well please. Unbridled access to any woman on earth every day you wake up the rest of your life. You can live in any house, any fucking house you, that your heart desires, you are welcome to live in. You can drive any car. You can have any food. You can have anything delivered. You can have absolute unvarnished, unobstructed, uncontested power the rest of your life. I kid you not, after about three days, you'd want to fucking kill yourself. You'd want to fucking blow your brains out from having that, that much power and that kind of, those kind of options. Shows you how powerful life is, eh? Shows you that it truly is, at the end of the day, a game of tug of war. It is a tug of war. You know what I'm saying? You don't want that kind of fucking absolute power. And it blows my mind that a guy like Putin actually does have that. That motherfucker literally, you want to talk about the limitless pill? He's likely the most powerful person on the planet. And I guarantee you in the wintertime, when that motherfucker steps out from the Kremlin, wherever the fuck he lives, and he looks off into the fucking wilderness and sees one of those fucking Russian timber wolves in the winter hunting, fucking stealthy, lean, emaciated, hungry. I guarantee fucking to you there's a part of that dude that's like, fuck, man, I want to go back to that. I missed the days where I was running lean because I was fucking hungry, where my rib cage was jutting out a little bit from my fucking skin because I was fucking starving. 
That's why I said reality is a disc because it's everything is circular. The cycles are 100% circular. You could be at the top one moment, but if you shift just slightly to the right, you know what I mean? You're, you're spiritually homeless. And I believe a guy like P Putin is craving to be spiritually homeless. But then, you know, it's like you get to that level and what you're now doing is you got to erect different mental prisons just to keep yourself sane. You know what I'm saying? Like there are some, there are very few downsides to the situation that he's in. Number one, motherfucker cannot leave the country ever. He's 100% stuck there. Number two, he can never choose to step down from power or he's a fucking dead man. And that's why they say heavy, heavy is the head that wears the crown because that motherfucker truly is has to construct now mental... And look, this is what's another interesting facet. This is where discipline really comes into play. Discipline comes into play at the top when you have a gigantic, colossal plate of responsibility. This is where discipline really saves your life. There is no doubt that the level of frame and state control and self-control that that man has to have is otherworldly. It's eldritch. Because if it wasn't, that motherfucker literally wouldn't be able to get out of bed every morning with the limitless options that he has. It's absurd. So you always got to swing wildly when you're on your way up. And then as you ascend, you can curtail and you can temper the beast within you through discipline. There's no doubt that the key to sustained success is discipline, right? It's just a very, very, very bad method when you are not where you want to be yet. It doesn't go very far. Fucking take some questions. Yo, what's going on? I'm doing on? great. How are you doing, man? Good. Hey, my question is, in the beginning of the space, you talked about how if you identify you're funny or if you identify you're smart, that goes away. Does that work in a similar like way where if you identify an edge or you identify your success, it, it vanishes instantly? 100%. Because look, the only thing that matters is the performance. Skills don't, skills don't mean jack shit. There's a lot of very talented motherfuckers who, look, everybody's like this, right? Everyone, everyone is wonderful, delightful, comfortable around, around their loved ones. Everybody is. Everybody is fucking lovely, delightful around their loved ones. But how many motherfuckers can actually shine in the arena? How many? Very, very few. And that's where all the glory goes to. Everything is about the performance. It's not about the skill at all. And that's why... If you readily ascertain why you're good at what you do, you got a fucking Schrodinger's cat on your hands. It's, it's the most wild thing I've ever fucking seen. And look, there's a lot of content in the unconscious mind that once they fizz and bubble up to the surface, they also dissolve. So it's like a lot of times when you, when you saliently put focus on something that is beneficial to you, it, you actually end up dissolving it. It, it, it loses. It's like putting fucking Alka Seltzer in fucking water. You know what I'm saying? You got a 10 minute half life and then you're, it's, it's, it's fucking disappeared for life. And that's why I said, I don't think it's wise for men to examine the contents of their unconscious mind. There are, there are, um, there are zombies, there are zombies and there are, you know what I'm saying? Like you don't, as a man, you don't have to be a necromancer. You don't have to disinter every fucking corpse in your past in order to fucking make progress. Some of that shit needs to just stay where the fuck it is because you trust that your nature and your instincts are suppressing things that don't matter. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, especially if like your, your positives came from you just not acting naturally. If someone is a good baseball player, they learn the swing from just playing a lot, not micromanaging their form. So when it breaks down, you can't micromanage. You have to just relax and learn to swing. 
That's exactly right. I cannot tell you or reverse engineer anything that I'm good at. I've never actively worked, consciously worked on a skill in my entire fucking life, ever. I have zero clue why I'm good at anything that I, that I do, and I don't give a fuck. I, I don't care to understand why. I just follow my natural inclination. And look, this is what I was telling motherfuckers. If you get to problems in life or you are trying something new or new activity and you're really, really horrifically bad at it and it feels like tremendous work and you got to fucking psych yourself up and you got to do all these fucking song and dances and rituals just to get yourself hyped up to go do it, you are 100% working on the wrong thing. Because the, the things that you're good at naturally are, are a pleasure to do. You know what I'm saying? And, and that was, that's been my whole life strategy. I tried music, hated it, fucking scrapped it. Everything that I tried that I didn't get a sense that I could be proficient at this in a relatively quick time, I just fucking discarded it and kept it moving. There's, there's, there's no reason to sit there and belabor yourself over things that you want to get good at that you're not naturally good at. It just doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense, but people waste years of their life to become barely proficient at things that they're just not naturally wired to do. And I think the reason for that is because they're afraid of failing. So they perpetu perpetually learn something when it really isn't the right thing for them, but they're just stalling and perpetually Bingo. learning. Bingo. Afraid to lean into the edge is what it is. Because that's scary, man. Like it's scary. Failing's hard, man. That just, it, it destroys your ego, but instead of course. just, of course, look, purgatory. look, some, some, like every man has a foundation with an edge. There's a, there's a foundation that has been given to you in some sort of divine providence. Every man has an edge, but if you can't cook on your fire and you can't lean into your edge, look, this is why a lot of people won't understand this, but I am actually pro uh, prescription medication. I actually am pro because there are a lot of people who don't know how to handle their edge. It just creates way too much self-destruction and they're literally going to kill themselves because they haven't learned how to cook on that fire. What prescription drugs do is they swap out the foundation completely. They swap it out. So someone with a foundation that has a very pinpointed edge, the, the fucking the prescription medication comes in and swaps it. So that person can actually have a chance. Of course, they're going to be in a semi-zombified state, but at least they have a chance of living some sort of semblance of a normal life. Because look, not every, that's the whole point of my content, right? And, and of course, not everybody's going to know how to lean into their edge. Most people are going to fucking burn the fuck out of themselves. Third degree. And for those people, I believe it's an adequate solution to swap out the foundation at a certain point. You know what I'm saying? Like if you've, if you, if you've been drinking and fucking doing drugs and, and, and for fucking 25 years and you still have made nothing of your life, might be time to fucking swap that foundation. And it also could be the fact that those people just aren't made to be the big players. I mean, people have to, you know, work the simple jobs and not everyone has that edge to, you know, move mountains. That's exactly right. Okay, well, I'll take, I'll take a lot of time. I appreciate you pulling me up, Root, and thank you. Yep. What's up, Francis? you brought me on stage so my question yeah, yeah so my question would be what separates uh, somebody who actually go goes on the journey of the no man's land and make it to the other other space that that is is it sheer will or is it something else um that's a good question Look, I've, I've always kind of had this, this kind of like rotating thought in my head. It's just been kind of like a circular theory that I fucked with. I kind of mean it in jest, but I kind of don't. I've always said being a billionaire is easier than being a millionaire because the path to millionaire is too clogged. Do you understand it? The path to millionaire is too clogged. Everyone's gunning for millions. And so of course, to a degree I'm being hyperbolic, right? But there is some actual, there is some actual truth in what I'm, what I'm saying. Like the path to billions is actually easier than millions. Like there, there is a ring of truth to that. And that's why I use the Tate example, because I, I'm telling you, man, everybody 
Someone shot a magnesium flare into the sky, removed the traffic cones, and said, walk on down the red carpet, buddy. And he Hollywooded, he Hollywooded his way to his position. 100% uncontested. How many motherfuckers do you know who can open a camera right now and tell you they are the sexiest man alive thousands of times and get millions of people to believe it? How many people can do that? That was his number one most powerful trait in ascendancy. Way better than any other fucking talent, the humor, the delivery, the funniness. It was that right there. I am positive that it was that level of bravado and confidence that was the gravitational pull. He got millions of people to believe that that's true. There you go. Architected reality. If millions of people believe it's true, how the fuck can you argue it's not? Mm Mm-hmm. See what I'm saying? So that was an open lane to the proverbial billions. Totally Mm -hmm. unclogged. I'll leave you with that. Yeah, thank you. Luke Hall, what's up? Hello? What's up? Can you hear me? Mm-hmm. Okay, I've got a question. In your docu-series, you were saying that you had an arbitrary goal to snatch 300 pounds and that you were going max effort and that you're extremely tired and you're so tired you could close your eyes and you could fall asleep. My question is, what was the point in that, really? What was the point of achieving that goal? Yeah, because you're clearly affecting other areas in your life by of being course. so tired. Two- Two things. One, strength. The stronger you are physically, the healthier you are. That's a fact. Okay. Okay? So if you are not as maximally strong as you could be by lifting weight, you are leaving health on the table. As someone who lives on the edge and has lived a very hardcore life, I need as much reservoir of health as possible to fucking cannibalize on my journey. So I need to be as humanly strong as possible so that I can tear through the meat and bone when the play calls for it. That's number one. Number two, it was an experiment in putting the conscious mind to sleep. There were days where I was on absolute autopilot. I don't even know how I drove my car from A to B. I do not remember driving and getting there. But I guarantee you during that flight path, I was actually probably the safest driver on the road because my body was just doing it for me. Do you understand? The instruments were, were very, very well calibrated to get me there. There were times where my eyes would fucking fall asleep. My eyes would fucking collapse and fall asleep when I would be fucking just sitting there. Look, I've, I learned so many interesting things on that fucking weightlifting journey. One of them was people don't realize just by having open eyes how much energy you actually burn. You burn a tremendous amount of energy just looking. Just staring off into the distance burns energy. Closing my eyes for 10 minutes and not even falling asleep was so conservational on the energy side that I could go lift again. Literally just by closing my eyes. And you want to talk about optimization. This is why I said optimization is built into the mission because your body will find ways to fine tune it on its own. I literally would learn that if I just shut my eyes for 15 minutes, I was actually conserving a ton of energy. And then I would open them and I'd be like ready to rock and roll again. So it was just about putting my conscious mind to sleep so I could perform at the highest of levels. Okay. And you said after three years, you got it or something. So after that period of time, did you just stop getting tired? 100% because your body adapts to anything that you put it through. That's what I was trying to say, man. It got to the point. And this is, look, there's 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 a lesson in here on injuries as well. Here's what I learned. The people who train hard every day don't get hurt in the gym. It's the people who take days off. Because when you train every day, in in my case, for example, your cartilage, tendons, and muscles are torn down. But they're torn down in equilibrium. So when your muscle contracts hard against the bone when you're doing a lift or you're doing a sprint, it doesn't contract as hard because everything is equally fatigued and your tissues don't get hurt. When you take days off, the muscle recovers faster than your tendons and cartilage. So you take two days off, you go back in, you do a max effort attempt again, your muscle is now going to contract against those weakened tendons and cartilage, and it creates a 
some, some centripetal force that basically just causes injury to the tissues. Like I, I literally would never, ever, ever have any nagging injuries if I just trained every day and kept myself equilibriumly fatigued. Okay, but wouldn't you feel like super stiff and just bad from training, like your body, like you couldn't? Come on, man. I'm a fucking Olympic lifter. My mobility's elite. You know how you, you got to have elite mobility to fucking throw 300 pounds over your head in a rock bottom squat and stand up with it. Shoulder so your mobility muscles weren't feeling. Yeah. No, not at all. You get to the point where you're not sore at all. You get to the point where squatting 400 pounds as to grass is as easy as walking to your car. That was that was your mobility whole... on point because you're training so much. Correct. I see. Because that's Correct. what happened with me. I've been training, doing the kettlebells a bit here and there. I was feeling so, so stiff. I just, just didn't see the point. Just go a bit slower and slower. Well, well yeah. You, well, yeah. It's a lifestyle, yeah. brother. You can't fucking expect to train in the gym an hour a day and then the other 23 hours of the day not move and you're going to make progress. I mean, I was, I was moving. I was dropping down and do a squat all day long. I would sit in accumulated, accumulated total time on, sitting in a, in a dead squat would be like three hours a day. Okay. For my hips, for my hips and my pelvis and shit, and I would just never get hurt that way. And that would be your recovery. Hundred percent. I also don't think how people understand limitations in mobility affects limitations in the brain. They're like, there's people here on this space that don't even understand that because their pelvis is so tight, their hips are tight, they can't even get full hip extension. They can't get full shoulder flexion. They can't reach their hand over their head without bending their elbow because they don't have any external rotation. They don't understand once you unlock the end ranges, the, the end amplitude of your joints, it, m- movement is freedom, right? So it's common sense that if you can add ranges of mobility to your body, that's going to unlock certain parts of your mind that are not awakened, that are in a slumber. It's incredible. Okay, so that's, why, it, that's why movement feels so good. So motherfuckers will fix their mobility and then suddenly their, their mind starts thinking better. Because you're turning so do you on... re- recommend before getting into all this heavy, heavy training, like you're saying, max effort is to get your first mobility on point? Dude, mobility is king. Stretching is lame. Stretching is worthless. Mobility is fucking king for mindset, for fucking everything. Mobility is the most important thing. You should be doing mobility every fucking day. There's certain shapes, there's certain shapes the body needs to be able to make, period. Okay. I'll leave you with that. Thank you. Thanks. J-A-I-D. Yes. Yes, bro. Uh, Just a question on success uh, and the way to talk. You mentioned that... um, I think you said you sort of have to speak to yourself to get yourself up. Um, the take example for it, for the, you, you gave there. Um, I saw, I watched Kanye West's documentary and Pharrell was talking about the Through the Wire song. Kanye played it to him and Pharrell's advice was never forget when you're coming up and have that element of self-doubt in yourself and don't let that ego um, consume you. So my question to you is, is that um, a tactic one can use in the way to the top to sort of create a battlefield in your mind um, <laughs> to rise to the top? What, what's, your, what's your thoughts on that R- rather than the, the, the Tate example uh, you gave there? I think that's a tactic to stay at the bottom, my brother. Look, <laughs> a lot of these guys, a lot of these guys who fucking reach success will literally, there's a natural human instinct to launch decoys and deter people from doing what you did. That's yeah. why a lot of very successful people give patentedly terrible advice to other people <laughs> because there is, there is a human instinct in psychology to preserve your tribe, preserve your wealth and preserve your methods. And so these guys, I don't even think it's conscious. I think unconsciously, a lot of these big killers will give you terrible, terrible fucking yeah. advice that they yeah. don't even use themselves to get to the top. What the fuck is Kanye West talking about going your fucking <laughs> ego? Yeah. 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 Okay. I he's see. a walking ego. Yeah. He's a fucking walking ego. Yeah. And without that, he wouldn't be Kanye West, right? You know. So. Hundred <laughs> percent. He's a yeah. fucking turgid ego. Yeah. He's a tumescent fucking mass of tissue that is that is fucking an ego. It's he's a walking ego. Yeah. Yeah. Fuck out of here. Forget about your ego. Yeah. It's kind of like that big bro thing, right? He's trying to do that. That like, big bro, like, oh, you know, don't do that. Don't do this. But 
He's, he's trying to sun you. Yeah. He's exactly. trying to sun you. And a lot of these guys do that. And like I said, I don't even think it's consciously malicious. I just think there's a self-preservation thing that comes in when people put in the sweat equity and the work and they've gotten to the top. They're like, you know what? Let me just fuck around here, lob some bombs, throw some fucking grenades, throw some people off, put out, spread bad cultures, whatever. I just think people have that natural inclination to do that. Yeah, 100%. So I'm very, very leery when these billionaires and shit are, are fucking, you know, trying to teach the common man how to rise to the top. Yeah. Fuck out of here. <laughs> no, I hear that, man. Respect. 